Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Eldon Taylor. Welcome to another hour dedicated to the notion of enlightenment, an hour for inquiry and reflection, all in our effort to understand exactly what enlightenment means and what it is to be enlightened. An hour devoted to exploring the edge of consciousness and all that is implied thereof, and an hour that recognizes the nature of the subjective experience as being at least as important as our objective reality that we reside within. Indeed, an hour for those who are unflinching in their journey to the authentic self and willing to examine their deepest beliefs and perhaps challenge some of those old ideas about the world we live in and the people we have become. This is an hour where we strive to evaluate knowledge as inseparable from the total experience of reality. I'm Eldon Taylor, and this is Provocative Enlightenment. All right. Each week I read some of your letters as our way of paying homage to the role you play in helping us to shape our show and improve it in every way. Last week, our guest was Colette Baron reed and we spent much of the hour getting to know her and her story, and then we discussed her new book, The Map. She informed us that she really disapproved of how the so-called law of attraction was explained. Sue wrote, I enjoyed the show. I found Colette Baron reed very interesting. Her remark about there being... No detour around suffering rang some bells with me. It made me think about the fact that it is not the suffering, but how you respond to it that counts. Well, that's always what truly matters, Sue, for we may not be in charge of the stimuli that comes our way, but we are definitely responsible for how we respond. Thanks for your letter. Elaine wrote, Eldon, I listened to your show today with Colette Baron reed and it was another great one. Thanks much. Patty wrote, this year has been so P.E. for me, E.T. I like that E.T. Finding your show through losing my job, how serendipitous. You have been a real integral part of my growing and love of life. Thank you so much. Like I said, I don't do chat rooms, and you have me writing to complete strangers. Finding folks that think like I do, wow. You will never know the impact you have have made on my life. Again, humbly, excuse me, thank you. Shine your light, E.T. Well, hey, Patty, you honor me, and I am grateful. Nothing we do around here is of any value without all of you. Lots of light right back at you. Richard wrote regarding my newest book, What If? The Challenge of Self-Realization. Listen to this one, Ravinder. Quote, really an intellectually challenging book that correlates how very advanced math principles where simple but increasingly abstract notations can represent immensely large and complicated concepts, parallels the density of the perceptual machinery in our brains. The message that our perception can only skim the very top of the very deep machination that is going on. Close quote. Well, now, thanks, Richard, but you forgot to say how easy it was to understand the book. What do you think, Raph? I have to go back and look at that one again, too. Okay. That is definitely uh, food for thought. Donna wrote this regarding my book, What If? Eldon, when I first read it, I kept getting pissed off, and I would put it down. Then I would walk around the house arguing mentally with you, pick it back up and repeat. I have since read it three times and consider it one of my best experiences, a book that challenged me and made me think priceless. Well, thank you very much, Donna. Smokey wrote, I wanted to tell you your message helped me along my path. Thank you. Usha wrote, your programs are amazing. I've been using them since 2003, and they have supported me and changed my life to be absolutely fantastic. Everyone should have some inner talk every day. Well, thank you, Usha. I'll use your letter to segue into reminding our listening audience of the free MP3 inner talk programs that we make available at eldentaylor.com. This is a part of our own Pay It Forward program, so be sure to check them out. There are several titles available to do so, so go get yours today. Daniel wrote, I have owned a comic book store for 27 years, and after seeing your Hay House 3 DVD set, Change Without Thinking, I want to sell the shop and spread your word. My girlfriend watched it with me, and in three nights she realized more than any therapy she has ever had. Eldon, how can we help? Well, Daniel, you just did. You gave me both a a new, wonderful, warm, fuzzy, as well as a a great endorsement. And I appreciate that. And please continue to spread the word. William wrote, I have enjoyed your work for years and have purchased your books for many friends. 
Your ability to join mind and heart is the clearest expression of forward thinking thought being presented today. I applaud you for your commitment, courage, and dedication for change in the individual and in the world. A heartfelt thank you. Well, thank you, William. I'm truly honored by your remarks. Finally, Saeed wrote, Dear Dr. Eldon Taylor, sir, I am really inspired by your touching voice. You really motivate not man. You motivate passion and soul. You give hope. I am Muslim and from Karachi, Pakistan. My religion teaches me to learn good things and share with people no matter what religion and nation he belongs to. I love your work, sir. Well, once again, I'm very honored by your sentiments, Saeed, and I share your vision of union and peace throughout the world. Thank you. All right, that's all the time we're going to take for letters today, but I do invite you to opine by sending your email to Eldon at EldonTaylor.com and or by joining me on Facebook. You can also just leave comments on my website. I do try to read all of your letters. Obviously, we cannot get them all on the air, but they do impact our programming. I highly value your input. So once again, thank you, all of you. All right, our subject today... What's up with talk radio in today's world of communication? At the near speed of thought, to borrow a concept from Bill Gates, more and more authors, coaches, mentors, members of the clergy, indeed everyone with a message or an idea, they're lining up to become radio talk show hosts or personalities. In fact, one of the courses you can take from Hay House, usually during an author training on board a lovely cruise ship, is how to host your own radio show. And winners get to uh, host a show on Hay House Radio. So what does it take to be a radio talk show host, and what's in it for the host? I can remember my first radio appearance. I arrived uh, at the studio, and it seemed all so overwhelming to me. However, after a few guest appearances on KTKK Radio in Salt Lake City, I wound up co-hosting a show with Jim Kirkwood. The show was called The Good News Hour. And from there, I went on to hosting my own show. Now, that goes back 25 years ago plus. From the studio of those days to what you find today is quite a technological revolution. Indeed, often a radio show is conducted from remote locations and across media link-ups like Skype. With the dawn of satellite and Internet radio and now the new breed or hybrid, I guess, radio TV on the Internet, The proliferation of radio networks and shows is growing logarithmically. Obviously, the number of hosts is growing exponentially as well. And that leads to the question, why would someone want to be a radio show host? What's in it for them? Now, I know my answer to that question, but it's also not always so simple. Hosting a radio show for many is more an avocational undertaking than a job. So why do so many people want to be a host? For that matter, the stress that often accompanies the role of guest is such that one can also ask, why do so many people want to appear in the media, period, full stop? Joining me today is one of the better talk show hosts out there, at least in my opinion. Indeed, he employs a unique method of queuing up his guest, and that's music. I have been a guest on his show, met him personally. In fact, I've been a guest on his show more than once, and I love what he does. His sense of originality can take a difficult day of solid interviews, such as what I went through two weeks ago during the launch of of my book, What If?, and turn it into fun. Instead of the usual interview technique, he interposes music. But the music is themed to the interview and the upcoming question. So, for example, if your next question is about personal heroes, he may play the song Heroes and Friends. Very creative, very unique, and extremely enjoyable, I guarantee you. Okay, I'm speaking of my friend and the the award-winning radio and television presenter, Nick Lawrence. Nick is the host of Straight Talk on WEEU Radio in Reading, Pennsylvania. And I'm going to steal some of his thunder. I want to get into his head today and know what he thinks. So I have chosen music just for him. This... It's but a teaser by a very talented musician by the name of Johnny Ace.
All right. Let's just welcome to Provocative Enlightenment, Mr. Nick Lawrence. Welcome, sir. Hey, Eldon. How are you? I'm great. I went way down in your mind, Nick. That's here on Earth. That's what we want to know today. You want to know everything. How are you, my friend? I'm doing really well. And and, uh, I was listening to your music. I listened to your introduction. Thank you for that. It's certainly a an honor and a pleasure to be on your show this time. And I have to tell you, it's a little bit intimidating for me to be on the other side of the microphone. <laughs> I can't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, used to, I'm used to doing the interviews, not being interviewed. But this is great. It's, it's good practice, as they say, for me. Well, that's, that's wonderful. I'm glad you're here. Let's start by having you tell you know the audience a little bit about yourself and your history in radio, Nick. Well, it's, uh, you know, nobody can go through the entire length of their lifetime, but I've, uh, I've had some really great uh, role models throughout my life. I grew up in a very uh, strongly Italian Catholic family with great values, always encouraging us to be the best that we could possibly be. I guess I have to thank my mom for, for getting us into the entertainment field in some form. I had a human alarm clock when I was a child. Every morning we would wake up and I'd hear her singing some of the classic songs from the crooners of the 50s and 60s, and that set me on a path to wanting to get into music. Eventually, I had a band for about 20 years, a rock band and, and uh, you know, dancers and the whole deal. And at some point when I got tired of playing in, in clubs and doing all that stuff, I decided that maybe radio was a place for me to go. And one of the ironies of all of this stuff is that uh, when I was in high school and in college, probably the, the least likely thing I would ever th- would have thought that I would have done would be talking in front of an audience, being on the radio, performing in any way. But exact, in fact, in college, I think I had to beg my professor, my speech professor, to get a D because I was so <laughs> petrified about talking to people. But ultimately, as time went on and having, having the band, I think it, it uh, let me come out of myself a lot, and it moved me into this area of deciding to be on the radio. And that's how I got started. I, I've always thought um, that knowledge is, is power for me. I've always loved to learn. My family was not very educated, but they, had, they wanted us to be educated. And so I've taken that up, and I've, I, I love talking to people. I love talking about subjects. I like talking uh, extemporaneously. I, I, I believe that I would love to talk to any person that would like to talk to me. All right. So if I were to rephrase then or you know, take what you've, you just gave us and, and turn it back around, would it be fair to say that part of the reimbursement that you get – uh, out of being a radio show host is the opportunity to have these conversations with others, your passion for learning and what you gain as a result. Mm-hmm. I, I think that each time I interview someone, I'm reading their book, the, the book of their life, the story of their life. And, you know, I've always believed that that uh, creation reflects the creator in some form. And although somebody may be writing about a topic that doesn't seem like it's related to that person's personality, I think it does in some way reflect them and the type of person that they are. And so what I get from doing this is that I grow. I remember uh, when I had gotten out of college and, you know, started my life with my family and everything, I always wanted to go back and learn more and more and more. And, and I hadn't had the opportunity to do that because I was busy running a few businesses that I had. And I decided that I would bring college to me. And I would do that by uh, getting on a radio station and inviting authors to come and talk with me. And that's how I got started. And, and for me, the payoff is growth, learning, uh, it, just moving forward in my life, never never being satisfied with the amount of information that I have. All right. Well, now, what do you look for in a guest then, Nick? Well, what I look for, Eldon, is what I look for in you. I didn't have to look too far in you, though, because I need somebody who actually, you know, they have to know what they're talking about. They have to be knowledgeable. They have to be able to express themselves, uh, being articulate. I I like when somebody has a lot of passion in what they do. They're enthusiastic about it. You know, one of the things I've found uh, over the years of doing this, that there are many people that can write very well, but not necessarily every one of those writers can express themselves uh, as articulately as, as perhaps you would need to do an interview. So I'm always looking for people like that and somebody that is willing to give of themselves. And I like, as you mentioned in your opening, I like to, to do questions that are not those uh, standard type questions. I like to engage a person in conversation and kind of dig into who they are as a person and to, to bring out the best of who they are. You know, one of the things that I, and, and I just a little praise going your way right now, one of the things that I do notice in, 
in the interviews, the conversations you and I have had is as they are just conversations. And uh, and you do have a way of, of making your guests feel very relaxed at home, comfortable, like uh, just a couple of people sitting around the table. How did you practice that skill? You know, I, I, it's, that's a good question because I'm not exactly sure if I've ever practiced it. What I what I think of is this. My role is to make the guest, uh, the be the, you know how you treat a guest when somebody comes to your home, Eldon? Yeah. That's the way I try to treat the guest on the air, as if they were in my home, that they're the most important person. I, I, I use this expression. It does, it's not demeaning of myself in any way. I don't have an ego to bruise in a sense. In other words, I love making people feel good about themselves. I like bringing out the best of people. And my guests, the host, the host of my show, I like to do that with them. I like them to feel that they are in my home and I'm treating them like royalty and I want to get the best out of them. And so I don't know that I've actually practiced that. I think I maybe have learned this skill from my, from my mom in some way. She's a master at knowing how to talk to people. And uh, people seem to love her very much and they still come by to see her and, and talk to her about things. You know, now that's a rather uncommon approach for talk radio in this day and age. I mean, much of talk radio is caustic. Much of talk radio is, uh, you know, it. it what do you? I, mean, I guess I'm going to go a slightly different direction here. I'm going to ask you, Nick, what happens when you have this guest, and and they say something that you know is flagrantly wrong? How do you how do you deal with something like that? Well, in a lot of cases, because it depends on which show I'm doing. I have four different shows, but when I'm doing the straight talk show that I interviewed you on, uh-huh. there's not there's not a whole lot of room for people to to make flagrant mistakes because they're talking about a subject that they that they feel connected to that they're the authorities on. At least that's my belief. I've had some guests over the years that uh, maybe the way they presented it wasn't correct. In, in some way, and I try to soften that. I try to give the person the benefit of the doubt because I've always believed that, uh, you know, you meet whatever you're, whatever's coming to you, try to meet with kindness and understanding and compassion as best as you can. Again, my goal is to make the guests look as good as they can possibly be because they've been gracious enough to be on the show. It's, I, I'm, I am very appreciative when somebody decides to be on the show because they bring something to my audience that I alone couldn't bring to them. I, I'm, I'm going to come back and say, you know, that uh, that you you have a unique approach there in both uh, the level of appreciation and, and the way you treat your guests. So I know you often are called, uh, you know, upon uh, to teach people, potential radio show hosts. Uh, mm-hmm. What advice do you give someone that wants to be on your radio show or someone else's radio show? Well, I tell people that you got to start you have to start someplace. And, you know, I was thinking uh, when I was preparing to talk to you today, my background gave me some beginning, although, as I mentioned earlier, that I was afraid to be a public speaker in any way. Uh, My parents encouraging me to get into music, to become a singer and to have a band and all that stuff made some changes to me. So people have to start somewhere. At the beginning of my radio career, I had already been, I'd already had this band for many, many years and I enjoyed it. And and then I started a TV show where I was hosting uh, a financial show at one point and then an environmental show, which I still do today on TV. But I decided that, you know, maybe radio would be fun, but how would I get into that? So I personally went to one one of the uh, local small stations and told them what I was interested in doing. And like many small stations, they say, if you pay this amount of money each month, you can get started. And then, Eldon, I just jumped into it. I'm not suggesting that for anyone because I know there are radio schools out there. But I think if somebody has a uh, strong self, uh, self-awareness, uh, a sense of confidence, and a belief that they can do things, at least to try them out at first, I think that goes a long way. I mean, obviously, you have to have some some skills at to being able to speak articulately when you're on the radio. I remember back when I was a kid, and it wasn't something that I remembered personally myself, my, but my mom and dad and my, and my grandmother would always tell us that when my grandfather came to the United States, he was literally one of those stories about stowing away on a cattle boat. Whenever he came here, he came here with only a second-grade education, couldn't speak the language, but whenever somebody tried to ask him whether he could do something, he would say, of course I can he was never afraid to take that little bit of a risk and that little bit of a chance to to move forward to to better himself and and maybe that's where some of the things came from me but i think people need to have the courage to step out of their comfort zone eldon i'm not sure if that answered your correct your question directly or not but and i'm certainly more you know willing to expound on that if you need more of that 
No, I, I think you blanketed that area very well. Okay. All, all right. You know, let's deal with some of the kinds of issues that you deal with as a talk show host. Okay. What do you What do you do when you have your guest and uh, you've anticipated maybe? Uh, a one-hour interview, you've laid out 12, 15 questions, which generally for most guests is more than adequate, and you get 12 or 15 yes or no's, and you look at your clock and you've got 50 minutes still left in the show. Well, that that's uh, it, that has happened. So per- <laughs> yes. personally, I mean, I, I try to have 25 or 30 questions, but my style is not just to go down the list and asking questions. So I've tried to develop over the year this over the years the skill of being able to fill in when I'm not getting a whole lot of response because there are authors who will give you either one word answers as you said like a yes or no answer or they'll say like a, they'll say a line and then they're stopped and then here's another thing that a lot of people will do they have been schooled I guess by some schools on how to market themselves that when you go do a radio show you get out all the salient and bullet points right away so somebody will will do all of those points in the first uh, three or four or five minutes of the show, and now you have another uh, 55 minutes to fill, another 50 minutes to fill with things that you're mentioning. So I guess the biggest thing for me is to try to always play off of what the person says, and I trust that I'm going to be able to bring out from the person more than what they've told me, or I'm going to try to fill in the blanks with what I know about the subject. Cool. Now, you know, I get to play the role of host and obviously guest quite often. Yeah. So, you know, I I am very familiar with what you say, this soundbite training. You uh, you know, I I recently, as a case in point, had uh, an appearance on Man Cow's show. Okay. And, you know, it's a highly rated show. And you you have, you know, two to to four minutes for whatever your answers are. And and I have have found for myself that that's the kind of interview that is very difficult for me to do. You know, someone, someone asks a question that I'm accustomed to giving maybe three or four paragraphs for how you boil that down into a sentence is is something beyond me. I, I just haven't figured that one out. Do you think you could take the role of a of a guest and go in and answer quickly those kinds of sound bites? I guess it would depend on the topic, but I would say no, only because I you know, people say that I have the gift of gab. I mean I don't believe that of course, but um I think it would depend on the topic, but I, I, it wouldn't be comfortable for me to do that. I love to talk, to explain, to make sure. I mean, part of my background is I was a teacher for, for probably about 10 years. And I and one of the things I remember in one of the first classes I ever taught was that I I'm felt that... I'm going to have to ask you to hold that one, sure. Nick. We've got a hard break coming Not a up problem. here. But we'll pick it up when we come back. Okay. You're listening to Provocative Enlightenment. We're discussing talk radio, its growth, hosts, guests, and... And, of course, the listening audience. There are links on the chat room that will lead you to our guest radio program. Uh, be sure and check them out while we're at break. We'll be right back after these words from some of our friends. So stay tuned. Do you feel like you've become lost in a funhouse? Only seeing the reflection of yourself, past, future, and present, but unable to find the real you? I invite you to step through the doorway and onto the path leading to understanding of your mind, your choices, and the influences that surround you. Read Elton Taylor's New York Times best-selling book, Choices and Illusions, now expanded, updated, and revised. It will provide you with real-life examples of how you can break free from your current perceptions and begin your journey to how high is up. Get your copy today from all bookstores or online from Amazon.com or Barnes & Noble. Close your eyes. Imagine your goals and dreams. What's preventing you from accomplishing them? Most often, we are our own worst enemies. I can't. I'm not good enough. It's time to reprogram that inner dialogue. Replace all those negative self-images with, I'm good. I am powerful. I can do anything. Eldon Taylor's Inner Talk patented subliminal technology does just that. Researched at numerous universities such as Stanford and by governments such as Mexico and Germany, 
InnerTalk has repeatedly been proven effective at changing your self-talk. Stop imagining your goals and make them a reality today. Visit www.innertalk.com. That's I-N-N-E-R-T-A-L-K dot com. InnerTalk dot com. Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Eldon Taylor. Welcome back. If you just joined us, we're discussing the role of talk radio today and the media. But before we get back to today's show, I want to invite you to like our Facebook fan page for Provocative Enlightenment Radio. As a fan of the show, you'll receive special announcements and incentives from time to time as our way of thanking you for your support. I would also like to invite you to join me on Facebook while you're there. And, of course, you can follow me on Twitter. I would also be honored if you could uh, become a fan of my new Huffington Post blog. It's easy to find me. Just go to Huffington Post and search Eldon Taylor. All right. Now back to the show. Nick, before the break, you were telling us about your life as a teacher. A teacher. What, what did you teach? Well, I was a, uh, I taught French for a number of years, and I also taught philosophy. I was one of... I, started a course in high school, I felt that kids would benefit from learning about philosophy because that was one of the majors that I had when I was in college, and, and it really was a, a great success. So what I started to tell you was, and how it gets into the whole idea of helping people who want to get into radio, is that I, I remembered one day in class after about a year of teaching that I was teaching a lesson on, on some grammar point, and I noticed that the kids didn't seem to be into it. As much as I loved them and I, as much as they, I think they cared about me as a teacher, I just didn't seem like I had that spark that day. And I remember making a commitment to myself at that very moment that I would do my best to never bore those kids again. And, and, it, and it worked for me. And then I realized after that that um, it was important for me to always be exactly what I wanted them to be. If I wanted them to learn French, I had to be French. If I wanted them to learn philosophy, I had to be philosophical with them in some form. I had to be the very thing that I expected them to be. And so that brought me into talk radio. When you ask me about how to help people get into radio, I think as a talk show host or as a radio host or getting into, into the media at all, you have, to think, you have to think in two places. You have to think of yourself as the host and the listener. That way you're always sensitive to the way they would hear what you're saying, and then you're also sensitive to what you are saying to them. So I've always tried to, to uh, keep that balance, thinking myself, I'm, I'm listening to what I'm saying as well as, as that I'm saying it myself. You know, what comes through, and, and I'm partial and you know that, but what comes through is why you are the exceptional host that you are. <clears throat> That's nice of you right. to say, Elton. Well, it's also true. Uh, you know, I, I want to get back to your music here for a minute because, I mean, first of all, that is very creative how you do that. But uh, the band, is your music available? I mean, do you uh, still play? Tell us tell no, us more about that. Actually, when I uh, went into talk radio, that was the end of my band playing years. We had a seven-piece group. I had actually two ex-Philadelphia cheerleader, cheerleaders who were dancers and singers. It was really a, a great part of my life. But you get to a point where, as I said, you stop wanting to carry the equipment around, and I was looking to expand my level of creativity in some way. So the music that I picked, though, for the, for the shows, I think that comes about because of all the years of playing in the band and all the different types of songs we used to play. We could play music from the 30s all the way through. I think we stopped the band in 1995. So we'd play music from every era, whether we played it at proms, at parties, at weddings, at banquets, and, and every type of thing you could think of. So now when I do a show, I pull on that information. And I try to think, yeah. you, know, you know, when you and I did the show, What If? Uh -huh. I, it's the first thing that came into my mind was the song Alfie. And I, I just got I just gotten a, a CD from Steve Tyrell, and so I figured the, the words of Alfie. What's it all about, Alfie? It had to fit exactly with "What If" from Eldon Taylor. So that's how I picked it. I, I, don't, I trust that whatever comes into my mind, Eldon, I trust that it's the right thing. Now that doesn't mean I've always been successful at it, but I've got to believe in myself enough that I can believe that what I do with good intention will work out the right way. Uh, and it does. Okay, let's 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 now talk about the philosophy side of uh, okay. of Nick Lawrence. 
you uh, studied philosophy in school. I take it that was a major based on what you were saying? Well, I mean, I, it, I grew up in an Italian Catholic family, so where do you think I was destined to go at some point? <laughs> Okay. So theology, up, probably. Right. But, I ended up in theology in a, in a seminary, and, uh, you know, it really wasn't for me, but I, I understood what it was all about. I'm certainly grateful and thankful that I was there, but it did get me into, the, into studying philosophy. And I had one professor, of all the professors that I'd ever studied with, studied with, I had one professor that literally allowed us to question everything. And that's why when you wrote the book, What If, what if everything you've learned was wrong. It just lit me up like a Christmas tree, because I had this one professor that encouraged us to question and challenge everything that we'd ever learned, not to doubt faith, but because if you question it, you'd have a stronger faith as a result of coming to your own conclusions and owning those things. So philosophy is an important part of my life, and I I try to live in some, you know, with a particular philosophy of life. You know, I, I, I too, love uh, philosophy. I have an absolute passion for it, studied it. Uh, it started out to be a minor, and by the time I was done, I had more hours in it than my major. Uh, and, and I've always looked at it as a, a, a master discipline. I think you articulate it very well. When you do question everything, when you do have an understanding of the philosophical underpinnings behind arguments, ideas, and and so forth... You get a, a greater flexibility in in digging out these little kernels that I think of as, and I'll put the word in quotes, truth. Yeah. But but furthermore, it gives you a great advantage then in terms of understanding the logic and reason of others, uh, especially those that you might be interviewing. Uh, you know, since you enjoy, and and I know this personally, you enjoy interviewing so many Hay House authors. No, uh, I I have interviewed. I was going down the list right now on our on our website at weeu dot com. There are one hundred and sixty six postings of shows that are up there that people can go to and listen to anytime they'd like to, and probably. Almost 60 or 70 of those are just Hay House authors themselves. Give uh, that website again. It's weeu.com, and then there's an icon, Straight Talk, for the name of the show. And people 166 can go there as often postings. As, pardon me? Great. I didn't, I didn't mean to cut you off. Keep going, please. No, that's okay. No. Um, so I forget what I was talking to you about. I forgot the... <laughs> Those were those are up there on that website for you, people to you, go to. You were telling us of the 166 postings, oh, yeah, most how many of, were Hay House a lot authors? Of them, right, a, a lot. Most of them, and a lot of them are Hay House authors because they tend to they tend to talk about the things that I'm interested in. I've, I'm comfortable with doubt, Eldon. A lot of people are not comfortable with doubting things. I'm comfortable with that because I believe that that knowledge is is infinite, that we're always unfolding and that the truth is unfolding and infinite. So therefore, if if I'm doubting something, it doesn't mean that I disbelieve it. It just means I continue to question it until I own my own beliefs about it. And a lot of people are not comfortable with doubt. They need certainty. And uh, I I don't seem to need that so much, even though certainly I have strong beliefs about things. You know, I I share that perfectly. One of my champions, I suppose, is Soren Kierkegaard and Mm -hmm. his his treatise uh, on theistic existentialism about the value of faith. Amazing. You know, it is. And, And without, you know, without the doubt, there is no possibility for faith. Everything deals in uncertainty. And and, you know, if we have certainty about everything in life, life simply ceases to be that fantastic, awesome thing that it is otherwise. I don't I don't think, and I'm not sure how you think about this, but uh, I don't think that faith and reason are necessarily mutually exclusive. I think that I really, they I think that one can lead you to the other and that they're both necessary for true growth in some way. I don't want to get too I, philosophical on your program here, but we're talking about it. So. No, but that's okay. I totally concur with that. I, I think, you know, they are uh, handmaidens, if you will, as right. long as, as long as we remember that there are limits to what we can do with reason and there are limits to what we can claim through faith. Exactly. I think there's a mutual respect there. Absolutely. Okay. We got a question out of the chat room. It's a question I was going to ask anyway. But uh, from the chat room, um, we want to know, uh, who is this from the chat room that wants to know, who is the your favorite uh, person that you've ever interviewed? Of the 2,000? 
yeah, you know, of, of 2000. Have you got to stand out there? Uh, this is Craig from the chat room, and he just says, can you ask if Nick Lawrence has had a favorite guest? You know, that's that's like uh, I, I it, it is literally hard for me to answer that. I, I could give you names of people that I've interviewed and why they have impressed me and why I've remembered them over some others. If you think you'd like me to do that. But it's hard for me to actually say there was one standout. I think and I know you didn't tell me to say this, but I'll say I think that what you write about is as close to who I am as anything that I've ever as, as anyone I've ever interviewed. So that's why I can really get into the things that you write about. But, you know, I could, I could mention somebody like uh, Susan Smith-Jones. She's a Hay House author, written, I think, 27 books. She's literally changed my life in the way that I eat and the way I think about food. Somebody like Doreen Virtue has opened the door uh, for me to understand the connection with angels. You mentioned, I think, Colette Baron reed You might have interviewed her, I think, last week or the week before. Right. What an amazing person, C- connecting me with the, with the world of, uh, of psychic abilities. Bruce Lipton with the biology of belief. I can go down the list here. Uh, Thomas Moore. Um, uh, Karina Morariu. It's a name that maybe a lot of people don't recognize, but she wrote a book called uh, Living Through the Racket, uh, an amazing comeback story for her. Uh, she was like the, ranked the number one tennis, uh, doubles tennis champion in the world in 2000. I think it was 2000, 2001, and uh, went through a bout of leukemia, changed her entire life, and then she came back from that, Eldon. I mean, I can go down the wow. list of people who yeah. – I, I love the amazing story. Christiane Northrup, who lets women experience their womanhood and feel good about the changes that take place in their life. Dan Gottlieb opened the door to understanding uh, – the world through the eyes of his grandson who's autistic. We have a, a special needs child in our family. And so that book touched my heart a whole lot. So there are people like that that I've met over the years. And, you know, Immaculate Illy, Illy Bagaz, I think, uh, Illy Bagiz, yeah. as her name is, mm-hmm. led by faith. You know, what she had to go through through the genocide in her country and how she survived all that stuff. Honestly, Eldon, there is no one person that I can say is the absolute best. I take something good from every person that I interview. And, and there's so many different backgrounds and so many different uh, contributions that they all make. Uh, I, amazing. I, 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 right. I don't know about you, but see, I love to talk about anything. I can talk about anything. I, I believe that I want to be able to talk to any, about anything to anyone. I, I'm not afraid of any topic. I would say that if I have any weakness, it's talking about sports. It just does, I played sports all my life but it's not something I've shown an interest to it in trying to, uh, to learn a lot about it. But every other subject, pretty much, I can talk about, and I love to talk about those things. Uh, again, that's, that's one of the qualities that makes you such an outstanding host. Uh, you know, we have another question out of the chat room. I'm just going to run through these real quick, like okay. here. Lynn says, uh, when choosing music for your shows, who finds it for you? I think you may have answered this already. You, do you look for music by known artists? Are you interested in finding New music by lesser-known artists, and perhaps Lynn is a lesser-known musician, so you might, if you are interested, uh, let them know how they would get that music to you. Okay. I, I choose all the music. I'm the host and the producers of my own show. All, all the, I have four different shows, and I'm the host and producer of all of them. I do all these things myself because I like having a hands-on approach. Of course, I'm interested in, in any type of music that I could use as a theme music for any of the shows. And if somebody wants to connect with me, they can email me. I think that's the best place, Eldon, at greattalkradio at aol.com. That's greattalkradio at aol.com. Okay, now, last question. Well, I don't know if it's the last question, but I'm going to jump back to my own questions after this one anyway. Uh, this one says, great hearing, Nick, a very clear voice. Is there any way to get more tips as I have done some hosting TV and radio? Any way to get more tips? Yep. Again, I, I, would, I, would ask a pers- I would ask them to email me, and I'd be glad – Put their questions in an email. I'll be glad to respond to them. Or, if, you know, if once they connect with me, uh, I'd be willing to give them a number where we could contact and talk with each other. All right, excellent. And then that email again was? Great Talk Radio. All three words spelled exactly the way they should be. Great Talk Radio at AOL.com. Okay, and the website was weeu.com for right. 166 postings, and, and they're great. I mean, you, you heard Nick call out some of the, the guests. That's just a few of the guests, but if you like Hay House uh, and Hay House authors, uh, you're going to find most of them, if not all of them, 
uh, at his website and uh, and and some great conversations. I have looked myself at those archives; it's very impressive. Let's get back to uh, you know the most important thing about your show. When you when you look at a show and you, I mean, just not a given uh, a given individual, but what it is that you want to take to your audience. You say you're never going to bore your students. What, what philosophy do you take to what is it you're always going to do or never going to do with your radio show? Well, first of all, I'm always going to be enthusiastic. Uh, and and it doesn't matter how I feel on that particular day. I'm always going to, as I said, my analogy was how do you treat a guest when they come to your home? I'm always going to be enthusiastic. I'm always going to be upbeat. And I can take any tack that I need to. Like what I'm doing Interactive talk. I do, one of the shows I do is called Straight Talk Live, which is a call, live call-in show. And in, in that show, you know, I, I do what the typical talk show host does. I do a little monologue in the beginning to stir up uh, thinking and conversation. But, so I'm, but I'm always going to have information. I'm always going to be uh, passionate about what I'm talking about. And I'm always going to be enthusiastic because I think the energy that the host presents brings the people into the show. Or at least it, once they're there, it keeps them there. As far as what I'm never going to do, that's a, that's a whole other <laughs> issue. Uh, I'm never going to criticize a guest. I'm never going to put them down, uh, you know, even if it's on the call-in show. I'm never going to make fun of them, ridicule them, make them feel ill, feel Ill at ease. I'm always going to be uh, conscious and sensitive to the fact that they've taken the time to give me a call. Or if it's a guest like somebody like yourself, like an author, that they've taken that time uh, to make my show special enough that they're willing to be on with me. Do you like to chat with your guests before you go live uh, to kind of sort uh, out things, warm up things, or do you like to just begin cold, Nick? Well, you know, actually I've done both. I like a, a few minutes before the show just to get, uh, you know, a little connection with it. It really depends on how I've gotten that guest. I mean, a lot of people come to me through the publicist, they like at Hay House, or have uh, publicists from other, um, you know, publishing houses. And if I've talked to them in advance and we've spent some time together, um, then I don't need to spend that much time before. But I always spend a little time before and hopefully a little time after to see how they felt that the interview went. I, it's all To me, Eldon, all these things are relationships. It's just the way you and I are when we're on the radio and when we talk in person. It's a relationship. And I want to make the best of that relationship, and I want the person to go away from me feeling that they just had a great interview, the best that they've ever had, and that – they're going to want to come back again sometime. And it's the same with the listeners. I want people to come back again and again to listen to what I do. You know, now, a little bit of a confession here, Nick. You see, I've always looked at my radio show this way. As a very young person, I imagined the possibility of uh, having a round table. And, uh, you know, it, uh, I have a, a studio, and in it I have a large conference, mahogany conference table that's mm-hmm. little, you know, on the ends. And, and I can imagine sitting at that table and having the Socrates and the Plato and the wow. Thales and the Aristotles and, you know, the Einsteins and the Bohrs and the Bohms and, and uh, depending on the subject matter, and, and asking them personally questions. Uh, to get inside their minds and discover, you know, what makes their genius truly their genius, okay? Mm-hmm. I've always, always thought that would be just a, the most marvelous thing. And, I, and I've, I've imagined it from time to time and even had the dialogues in my head, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then coming to radio, I think, you know, to me, the radio show is about that opportunity. I can go out there and I can get the best of the best. I can get the people that, that write things that I'm truly interested in, that express ideas that, you know, I, I'd really like to know a little more about this. You, you didn't quite fully flesh it out. And, Nick Lawrence, I bring you to the show because I really, truly admire your style, your your enthusiasm. I have done hundreds, thousands of radio appearances and the way you conduct an interview and the way you manage your show, as far as I'm concerned, there isn't anybody does it better. Uh, Eldon, that, I mean, that's a, that I certainly do appreciate. Let me just make a comment as you're talking, okay? You know what makes this good? You know what makes you good? And, and hopefully I'm in that same league with you is this, that if anybody's listening to this show today, and I know they are, it's hard to tell who the guest is and who the host is. See, so that's a relationship of equals. And I think that's important. 
It doesn't, it doesn't mean that one person has to dominate the other person. You and I share ideas. We grow together. We grow from each other's conversation. I grow from you, and hopefully you grow from the questions that I ask you when I'm doing the interviews. But I think a tribute to you is that if, if anybody's listening to this and they say, well, I wonder who the guest is, I wonder who the host is, they're not going to know. And to me, that's a strong point. That's a marvelous point. But I'll tell you, I have, teacher, <laughs> written notes today in, uh, <laughs> because you have brought many things into focus for me that, that hopefully will make a better, you know, a better radio host out of me. All right. I, I've got to ask you now some, you know, those those hard questions. That's fine. What do you think? What do you think of the role of talk radio in our world of 24-7 media today? Well, I think it's powerful for one reason, and that is it's interactive. It's different from blogging. It's different from writing an editorial in the newspaper. It's interactive. You get immediate response. Somebody says something on the radio, somebody calls in and responds, and thousands or perhaps millions of people are listening at the same time. So it has a great uh, propensity to move people quickly. It would be like somebody standing in front of an audience of a million people with a megaphone or a microphone and trying to influence them in some way. So I think it has a, a big role to play. The only the only thing that I see part of it is since since the talk radio is predominantly dom- dominated still by conservatives, I, I think they tend to be what I, I called years ago political evangelists. They they harangue the population with the same thoughts, the same ideas, day after day after day, and eventually it gets in. I was a language teacher, Eldon, and and what you knew as a language teacher was that you had to do repeat, repeat, repeat. Repetition was the key to success, and that's what happens, I think, with talk radio sometimes. It's the constant uh, barrage of the same thinking. There are just different voices saying the same thing, a little variation on the theme. And and I couldn't concur more. I mean, we have talked about, you know, mind programming. That was one of my books and the role media. Exactly. And and, and all this soundbite reasoning that is a result of, as you would say, the repeat, repeat, repeat uh, kind of approach. That said, what do you think then of the notion of equal time? Well, I don't think you can force equal time into this. I, there may be a, been a time when that was so. I, you know, what stations tell you, what the marketers tell you, that let the market decide, okay? But you see it shifting already. The, the strength of, of conservative radio is beginning to change. It probably has something to do with President Obama being elected. I think there needs to be a place for everyone. I think there has to be an, an open forum place. I don't know that anybody should be required to, to uh, provide equal time because they, these are businesses and, and things. Uh, the, these stations and, and networks have to make money. I, I just think that a lot of times in talk radio, especially with a particular strong bent that's out there, that it's, it's, the, uh, it's opinion masquerading as the truth. And I think that's what people don't realize. They're, they can't see beyond that point. Don't you think that's true, not just of talk radio, but uh, of the media in general nowadays? I mean, uh, I don't know where you get your news, but it's hard for me to find news free of an agenda. No, I agree with you, Eldon. It's not, you mentioned talk radio, but actually it's across the board and, and all the major uh, media sources. It's the same everywhere because everybody does have an agenda, and unfortunately the population doesn't know how to question things, or because TV is not interactive, you can't question. And even on the radio many times, since they have call screeners, you cannot really challenge the host in some of those shows. And to me, that's a problem. If you're going to have a free and open uh, discussion, then people should have the opportunity to challenge the host. I totally concur. Now, real quick, like in about 30 seconds, uh, Diane Ray, who is the uh, network manager, I had a conversation with her recently, and I I pointed out to her that you were going to be on the show today and that you would like her job, Nick. Uh (laughs) <laughs> well, that probably wasn't the best way to approach it, <laughs> but that's okay, Eldon. That, that's whatever we – this is what I think. I'd love to be a Hay House um, interviewer. Why? Because I'm, I'm at home with the Hay House authors. It's like me coming home. I've interviewed so many of them. They talk about the topics that I love. And uh, I'm passionate about the things that they bring to the table when I talk to them. And, you know, I, it certainly would be an idea that I'd, I'd love to entertain if that ever becomes a possibility. Well, you just never know about that. All right. We've come to the end of our hour. Uh, my host today, or my yeah, my host, my guest, my friend, Nick there Lawrence. WEEU.com. Be sure you go to his website. 166 postings there. Nick, I've loved having you here, and uh, I appreciate it very much. I hope you've enjoyed. Goodness. Thank all of you for joining us. 
Remember, until next time, wherever you are in the world, believing in yourself always matters. 